I will be sticking reasonably close to that, but highlighting certain points out of that. You will notice there are diagrams of the operation. Uh, I'll be talking through those in a, a little bit more detail to give you an understanding of the, the specific operation you have and his role in it. Uh, and then um, using it to illustrate some of the other points about the roles that we do. Uncle Leon Smith uh, was 33 years old. Grew up in Wellington and moved to Auckland uh, for his work. Initially, he had uh, joined the Navy and reached the rank of ensign before resigning in January 1909. In 2005, he joined the Army as a territorial force and then did the SAS selection course in 2006, which he successfully completed and became a badged member of the SAS in September 2008. He was promoted to Lance Corporal in January 2011. Although junior, he was very operationally experienced. He spent almost 11 out of the last 24 months on operations. He was an advanced medic, and as a tragic indicator of the tightness of the SF organizations, it was Lance Corporal Smith, who was the first on the scene when Corporal Doug Grant was killed. Lance Corporal Smith was single and had no children and resided in Auckland. His uh, mother, grandmother, and two brothers live in Wellington, and his father and other grandparents are currently in Tauron. The family, the mother and his uh, brothers have asked me to read out a statement. Leon was loved by his family. He was also loved by his friends and his comrades. He was a wonderful grandson, son, brother, and a friend to many. He was sincere and genuine. Leon was proud to serve in the SES. He believed in what he was doing, and we supported him in what he did. We are grieving the loss of Leon. We ask for our privacy to be respected at this very difficult time. Rest in peace, Leon. I now want to move on to an operational overview of what happened. If you can turn to the diagrams, uh, I'll be able to talk you through uh, those circumstances. First of all, this operation was directed by the counter-terrorist police, the CTP branch, of the Ministry of the Interior in Afghanistan and executed by the Crisis Response Unit. The operation was authorised by an Afghan search and arrest warrant and then planned and executed by the Crisis Response Unit with mentorship and support from the SAS command team. The operation was carried out in response to time sensitive information being obtained about a compound housing a suicide bomb. This operation was Afghan led and an Afghan legal team accompanied the assault force onto the tank. Preparation for the operation occurred over several days. It was not an immediate response to a family dispute, as some uh, journalists out of Afghanistan are claiming. Unless it was a humdinger of a family dispute, the time taken to compile the information uh, to actually get the legal authority indicates that this was a measured and legal response, not a, uh, a response to uh, a neighbour giving information and a tip off. Lance Corporal Leon Smith was a member of the shadow team who were mentoring and assisting the coordination of the cordon being put in place. As this was occurring, Lance Corporal Smith climbed a ladder to be able to get a view about the placements of the cordon team. At this point, he was seen by one of the uh, persons of interest in the compound and engaged by fire. He returned the fire, wounding, sorry, uh, hitting uh, the person who fired at him. At this point, another insurgent um, fired at Corporal Smith, cre uh, causing his fatal injuries. The New Zealand forces moved to extract Corporal Smith, while the crisis response unit made an entry into the compound and cleared the compound. They conducted a search and found the male insurgent involved in, in the initial exchange of shots with Corporal Smith had gunshot wounds to the head, and a young girl had also been injured by fragmentation wounds to the stomach. Both casualties received immediate medical treatment. The CRU then moved to clear and search an adjoining compound. That is the compound in your pages to the top right. Simultaneously, the New Zealand forces and support conducted the casualty evacuation of Lance Corporal Smith and continued to provide assistance to the crisis response unit completing the assault. Although clearance and uh, the search of the compounds was carried out by the Afghan forces, our guys accompanied them to continue their mentorship and advice on that uh, role. Lance Corporal Smith was evacuated by helicopter to a nearby US base as quickly as possible. 
The second helicopter was utilized once the compounds were secured to evacuate the injured male uh, in the compound and the young girl. The male insurgent died of his wounds, however the young girl sustained only minor injuries and is expected to be released early today at that time. As proof of the validity of the operation, the deceased insurgent has since been confirmed as the person of, as one of the persons of interest in the warrant. In addition, a further insurgent who fired on our forces but was unharmed was arrested. He is also confirmed as a person of interest in the search and arrest warrant. These operations are a result of thorough intelligence and preparation. The intelligence utilised must meet required legal thresholds and evidential requirements before a warrant is issued by the Ministry of the Interior. There are multiple layers to this process, including a review by the forces who are enacting it to see if they have enough information to conclude that operation. And if not, the operation will not proceed. Often these operations are conducted in a hostile environment that does not have traditional combatant boundaries. And as you can see by the diagram of this operation, it was a mixture of buildings around. There was no clear front line and back line, or safe route area. Threats often emerge from unexpected quarters, as was uh, in this particular case. At all times, the CRU partnered with the SAS attempt to serve these warrants with the minimum of force and disruption. The idea is to capture and detain these people, not to kill them. And on 95% of these operations, a shot is never fired. On occasion, however, those being arrested can sometimes respond with armed force, as in this case. The SAS primary role is to partner with the crisis response unit. This involves the provision of specialist training. When the CRU deploys in an operation, that training role develops into a mentoring role where advice and counsel is provided. This requires the NZ personnel to be in close proximity to those people. An example could be if the crisis response unit was entering a building and moving from room to room or up a stairwell. Our mentors need to be there so that the Afghanis can turn and ask advice or reassurance. That means that our guys are within grenade range, are within rifle range, and therefore are in danger. Comments about moving to the front line versus a rear area role is therefore inappropriate for the type of mentoring role that our guys do. An example of that very circumstance is in the British Council Rescue, where specialist entry capability was needed, and our guys not only provided advice, but also had to provide skills that the Afghan unit had not fully acquired or mastered at that particular time. The only other option is to allow the crisis response unit to continue uh, with less than optimal skills, and therefore increase the risk of personal injury or operational failure. But in all cases, the crisis response unit is the first option, and our guys are there to provide advice, reassurance, um, as well as technical help where that's required. To finish off my uh, formal part of the briefing before I open up the questions, my condolences have also gone out to the family. I have spoken to both the father and the mother, and of course they are distraught. I have also spoken to the commander of the SAS in Kabul. I personally met Leon Smith a few weeks ago when I was in Kabul. He was a bright young man. He was a man full of self-confidence, as all those people in the SAS are. He is a tragic loss to our country, but he's also a soldier who knew what he was doing, who recognised the value of what he was doing, and actually died doing what he believed. Thank you. What is under US control in the US is responsible for what role did they play in this operation? Special operations uh, uh, have the authority to operate anywhere in Afghanistan based on their type of operation for the crisis response unit. They are responsible for responding to uh, attacks or threats of attacks or preparations of attacks into Kabul. They will often originate from the areas around it, and so the crisis response unit has the authority to operate in those areas around it. If it is applicable, then uh, support resources uh, can be uh, given by those conventional forces in the area. In this particular case, that was not So there were no US forces involved in this? Or did they were in the outer cordon? Or no uh, this was, yes, there were support agencies from other coalition partners that were used to coordinate that, but they were mainly in the, uh, the command and control uh, information flow support rather than troops on the
So whose decision is that for New Zealand troops to go in rather than Americans take care of their own? Um, the crisis response unit through the police, uh, the Ministry of Interior is responsible for the counter-terrorist operations in the Kabul area. They, uh, are, in this particular case where it was a deliberate detention and arrest operation, a search and arrest operation, that's a police responsibility. It therefore falls to the crisis response unit. We are the nation that uh, partners and mentors the crisis response unit. So we, um, we as in the collective the New Zealand crisis response unit team, is the one responsible. Are you, confident as, are you confident that all proper procedures and protocols were followed around the gathering of intelligence and the organisation of this operation? Yes, we are. The process to gather information is a, a detailed process. It requires uh, to meet very tough legal uh, requirements to do so. Uh, although there may be uh, some doubt about the quality of the Afghan uh, legal process uh, in rumours, the reality is that this is being mental and has visibility by UN and by ISAF, it's the partner nations processes they go through. We have confidence that the legal process used to compile the information, to make the legal decision that this is a legitimate target, to authorise the warrant to go and arrest them, uh, that that process is legitimate and can stand up to international legitimacy. So it was either the man who was killed, or the man arrested, the suspected suicide bomber, and did you find suicide deaths? We've identified the two people, the person who was killed in the operation and the person who was detained, are two of, were two of the names that were on the search and arrest warrant. And did you find suicide? I'm not confirmed what other information or, or access we have found in this. Just was a um, US airstrike in that province um, earlier this week. Was it anywhere near that compound or that area? Um, I'm not aware of that. How many operations but it was not connected to us. How many operations have the SAS been involved in in Warback as opposed to Kabul? Uh, I don't have the detail at hand, but it's quite frequent for us to operate in Warback. It's an area that surrounds the, uh, the capital, and therefore it is a frequent launching base for, uh, for op insurgent operations uh, into the capital city, as is the area to the east and to the north. Have you read any explanation? I mean, our reports are that spokespeople for both the government for the head of the crisis response team have suggested that this was um, not necessarily insurgents but some sort of family dispute. If you, have you found out where that information may have come from? Um, well, as I was saying at the start, this must have been a humdinger of a family dispute for it to start the process of 48 hours beforehand. So this is the, the location. The fact that we found the two guys that we were after and that they were legitimate targets that have been legally proven and authorised to be arrested because there was legitimate proof of their engagement as IED facilitators, suicide bombers. So yes, we are absolutely certain this was not a family dispute. The fact that they had sentries on the roof and that they engaged us is, uh, in that discovery shows that um, this is not uh, as claimed by that journalist. When you say there was proof that they were IED makers, so as a result of the operation or before the warrant was approved? Um, there was enough proof in the system, of evidential proof, which actually uh, convinced the legal process that there was evidence to arrest these people. So yes, there was uh, enough evidence to arrest, uh, sorry, to issue an arrest warrant. Are you confident in the abilities of the CIU, given that both those the have happened whilst the SAS has been uh, mentoring them rather than in previous, uh, previously they were there operating in the SAS before. Is it putting them in extra danger playing that mentoring role? There is no more. The mentoring role is always dangerous, as was the previous role they were performing. A term I've used before is by good fortune. Uh, we have avoided casualties up to this day. Fortune is a mix of preparation and skill, but also a bit of luck. There have been several occasions in our operations, both in the PRT and in the uh, SAS partner of the Crisis Response Unit, where we could have had casualties by our own skill, by our own uh, talents and ability and toughness, as well as by sheer luck. We have avoided casualties in the past. Yep. The, this, the incidents or, or the frequent incidents are a change of insurgent tactics. 
which are instead of spreading their attacks across Afghanistan are focusing on high profile areas, means that there is more likely to be attacks in Kabul, Kandahar, big city areas, Jalalabad areas around here, and we're responsible for one of those. But there's also uh, a case of the fact that we've been successful in other areas in our uh, transition in, uh, in Bania also means that the uh, insurgents want to say, well, we'll show you that there is no safety. So often that success puts us into the heart of those areas. Given the rise of the number of attacks that I Um, is, is it putting them in more danger by operating with half the force that originally is deemed necessary to go in there? First of all, there is dispute over that report. Um, the ICF report that we operate from indicates that across Afghanistan the number of attacks is less uh, in the past, but they're concentrated in different areas. Uh, and uh, that report you're referring to has only just been released, and ICF will be releasing, as we understand it this afternoon, Afghan time, uh, their response to it. Um, so, and the second part of your question was... Um, are you confident that there's not been an extra danger by having half the force there that was originally deemed necessary? Um, the structure beforehand allowed us to do concurrent tasks and we were still able to do the same tasks we're doing. Uh, and so, no, there's no more danger attributed to having a small force. It just needs to prioritise what it has to do. Although, can you just read two then? He spent a year of the last two in Kabul. And that's a taxing workload, albeit for a very qualified soldier. This is the reality of our operations, not only in the SS, but in also in other parts, other critical trades in the Defence Force. There is a need to put people with certain skills into Afghanistan to, to meet their mission requirements, and this is the reality of a small Defence Force for time. Is it, is, it, is it a task that's too great for them? Uh, I mean, there's got to be some sort of fatigue that comes with that, that length of service over a space of two years. No, um, there are not reports of uh, the people are getting exhausted. We have adjusted the tenure of the time in, uh, in, in theatre to, to be able to give them more rest time or more respite time out. But the reality is the tempo of operations uh, requires certain skills and trades to go into. And uh, as a small military instance, it's not just the SES, a lot of the military skills uh, require to go back on quite a high rotation. Are the numbers of so the SAS soldiers badge members, you've got 15 here, you know, a, a small number, obviously, back in New Zealand. Are they keeping up with the rate of attrition and then obviously these losses that you've got on top of that? Is it a dwindling force? No. What about its operational efficiency? I mean, these are two highly skilled, highly trained men that require a lot of time and resources from the New Zealand military to get up to that standard. How can the SAS maintain its tempo of operations with these sorts of losses? The training regime of the SAS is something we can't talk about, but uh, the investment into uh, their facilities, the investment into their time and effort uh, is quite considerable. So we're confident that they maintain their world skills uh, through the training environment and the, and the regime that they do. Have. And that is matched by the rotation period going to the theatre. It's one of the reasons why we did adjust the, the time that they spend in the theatre so that fits in with their refresh of their training and a lot of But if you lose two of the elite, does that not impact on the ability of the wider unit to be able to maintain all its roles and responsibilities? The unit's big enough to be able to sustain uh, those types of resources. Um, it will always be a loss, and particularly our highly trained and capable people like uh, Corporal Grant and uh, Lance Corporal Smith were. Uh, but no, the unit can continue. This is not a critical loss. So could you just, he, so he was climbing a ladder. Um, to observe the cordon, but, um, and so he was not there in any sense um, planning to be engaged in combat, he just got... The Afghan, the Afghan, pause to give you a sound idea. The Afghans were in control of the cordon, their teams and their command elements were out placing them in here. Uh, the role of Lance Corporal Smith was as a shadow mentor to be able to go along and just to ensure that it was being done right and uh, to provide advice to the commander if he considered there was any uh, corrections to be made. He brought a small ladder and, and climbed over a roof so he could have visibility of the entire cordon, and that's when he came into view of uh, the enemy who was acting as a sentry. Is it this mentoring <coughs> words or friendly words so it seems acceptable to the New Zealand public, but largely um, our blokes are in this combat 
seen to all these elders to be a contact one. Yeah, and, and there has been discussions around is mentoring the, a term which actually provides it. We use mentoring because that is the term that I see if you use as partner in mentoring. But it's a discussion to say, okay, it's almost like mentoring like if you're a driving instructor, you're in the car, if there's a crash, you're going to get hurt. Are we misleading the New Zealand public over the use of this word? No, because I, I don't think we are, because that's why we're taking the time to explain what they do. But it is a case of saying, yeah, the term mentoring does need explanation. That's the why we're getting are you comfortable with Are you comfortable with the continuation of the use of that word to the New Zealand public if we do to lose some of our best selves? I think there are two things you're talking about here. The word could be changed to or explaining what the word means in this particular circumstance and what we're doing. What you're implying is, am I comfortable with the role of what they do? That's your question. Yes, I'm comfortable, but that is what they need to do to bring an Afghan unit up to the required speed. Well, would, would you, for instance, say they're on the front line? There is no, what I've tried to explain is the term front line is not applicable because in this type of environment, what is the front line? They need to be in the midst of the action to be able to provide that mentoring team. That has always been understood, and there's always been part of the message about what we're doing. But they seem to be elite combat troops um, in, an, in elite combat, uh, combat roles. Would that be a fair assessment of what they're doing? Of our guys? Yeah. yeah our guys are world-class capability. Uh, they have brought the crisis response unit up to being one of the best Afghan uh, units, uh, and therefore the Afghans are increasingly turning to the crisis response unit to solve those problems. And the Afga and the CAU is capable of dealing with the issues as they arise. But like any unit, the Afghan unit is only five years old compared to 55 years old of our SAS, and our skills are still well the back. So there will continue to be the mentoring need to continue to improve the CAU skills. Dr. The, CAU, the CAU is a very capable unit. Dr. McLeod, your question. Troops first went into Afghanistan to essentially get rid of Al Qaeda. Now you're saying the reason we're there is essentially to stop the Taliban taking over Afghanistan. I mean, some would see that essentially as popping up as what people refer to as a, a corrupt regime in Afghanistan. The Taliban, of course, were the very people who provided um, essentially safe haven uh, to Al Qaeda. And when they were essentially told by the United Nations, the world community, through the United Nations resolution, don't do that, or else uh, force will be used to remove you. They still said, no, no, we're going to provide safe haven. So they remain a threat. That's why the, the, the coalition, which, as I said, is nearly 50 nations, in fact, uh, has said uh, this is too, they are too big a risk to take over the government of Afghanistan. And it's also worth noting that Afghanistan's government is actually democratically elected. Now, I realise there are challenges around that, but, but they are fundamentally superior in terms of their respect um, and understanding of the rule of law than the Taliban ever were. You only have to think back to the past, uh, to the sort of thing that the Taliban actually did. Uh, you know, they hung hundreds of people in uh, the stadium. Uh, no, virtually no children went to school. The, the, the country was a complete wreck. You only have to compare the photos of the, the cities and towns from the 1990s to the present to see the change. Uh, both General Jones and myself have visited, and we have seen the change both in Bamiyan and Kabul. Yes, it's challenging, uh, and yes, there's work to be done, uh, but along with our uh, 50 uh, uh, partner nations, we want to see this. Uh, we want to see the Afghan government built to a point where it can essentially sustain itself. And that's what this particular mission is all about. You can I also just note on that point of mentoring? It's my view, actually, over the last two years, uh, we've been pretty clear uh, about what the, uh, the SAS is doing. Much clearer, I think, than in the past. And uh, you have uh, asked me and General Jones and others many questions about the particular operations, and we've been pretty candid about the nature of those operations as well. Um, and and uh, the Prime Minister has indicated that this kind of operation is amongst uh, literally hundreds that have been performed uh, in the last two and a half years. It's obviously dangerous. No one's doubting that. Uh, and no one's doubting that uh, our uh, 
men are literally within the range of lethal and mortal combat. Um, but I believe that the government is actually opening up the New Zealand combat about it. On that issue, I mean, there's a statement that's intended to be a question. When we've asked questions about that mentoring role, um, whether it's the, it was the attack on the green zone more recently or the intercontinental, we usually presented with information that goes, oh, they're still operating in a mentoring role. They haven't yet taken on um, an active role in the combat. It's really a false distinction, isn't it? We should stop reporting that to that people in New Zealand. We should just say they are involved in this operation. Well, certainly when I've been asked those questions, I've indicated whether they're sort of part of the assault group or whether they're supporting. But I've also indicated because uh, the, you know, they've been fired upon, you have seen people get wounded, for instance, and obviously people now actually being killed, that each of these roles is dangerous because they are, in a sense, in the thick of the action. The opposition. So do you see this combat role that they're in? <coughs> There's a substantial combat component to it. Yes. I mean, they're not, you know, to be, not trying to be flippant, but they're not standing there saying, there's the guy you shoot. I mean, they, if, if, there's a, if there's an insurgent there who's firing, they'll fire back. So isn't it, to some extent, a false distinction that we're making uh, and that maybe you're leading us to make? Well, I don't believe so, actually. I think uh, you know, we are supporting, um, but it's self-evidently dangerous and the roles can shift pretty quickly and easily depending on the circumstances. But mentoring means fight alongside. Well, in practical terms, it can mean that. It doesn't actually mean, in fact, it's more dangerous given the training <coughs> forces that aren't up to the same standard as the SAS. So it's, in fact, more dangerous for them to be in those operations than if they were just conducting the operation on their own. We don't do that to be the case. There's no concern in terms of engagement because of that distinction, that the determination to say that they're mentoring well actually um, makes it more dangerous because it limits what they would often, you know, would otherwise do or how they would otherwise react? Uh, the broad rules of engagement are in, in essence uh, very similar to previous deployments uh, of the, uh, the New Zealand SAS in Afghanistan. And this is an area that I take very particular interest in, uh, but I also invite General Jones to make a comment on that as well. Yeah, the, um, uh, the theme of the last few questions in here, um, this is the, the issue about what, uh, how you actually try to uh, how do you actually take a unit that's, uh, that isn't trained and actually bring them up to you? The, over the last uh, year or uh, year and a half, the focus has been on training them to pick up the tasks. They were then starting to be competently put into operations as they uh, are deemed to do. But part of that mentoring role is the ability to say, uh, is for them to bounce the ideas off or to provide guidance to say, hey, I don't think you've really cleared this uh, floor properly or we think you should shift your cordons around slightly to cover those DVUs around here. Their aim of when they do it is to not get engaged in the fighting, but the fact that they actually, if I use, go back to the analogy, be in the car when they're teaching the, the person how to drive it means that they are consequentially there as part of the danger. There is an element of danger of taking a unit up, but that's why our guys also have their own skills and there is a backup team to say, should it be really dangerous, our guys can step in with the preferences and the normal method of operation is the crisis response unit you know, deals with it uh, and they are capable of dealing with 99% of the situations in the case of, in the case of last corporal Smith, I mean you say he got up on a ladder to basically check to ensure that the um, Afghans had properly put the cordon around this compound. I mean I'm just wondering that if he'd been with simply an SAS unit, would he be checking on whether his colleagues have done it properly because he's not mentoring or training them. Oh, possibly, but um, that's a tactical situation and decision that we can't make in this room. Uh, he possibly could have come up with a ladder to get that over to uh, He was behind a wall, he was using it for cover, he didn't intend to be seen uh, by the opposing force, and so that's a decision that, well, that's a, a, a statement that I can't make at this stage. That was his decision on the ground to do that as he saw it best. Have you had a lucky <coughs> shot or? Was it a sniper type situation or a, the actual gun used itself? As we understand it, um, he had engaged the person on the, uh, on the roof that was essentially in here. As he engaged him, or within seconds afterwards, uh, a person came out very close to him and, and fired around the corner and was blindly around the corner and he was caught in the front. Did he engage the person on the roof first? No, the person on the roof shot him first. 
Um, have you published the um, SAS role of honour before like that? I don't think we have. Oh, no, it's been open source, yes. The information was out there. Question from the Minister. Um, the Opposition has made the, point, made, made, made the point that they feel that we're uh, taking the side in the civil war rather than fighting terrorism. How do you respond to that? Well, I don't believe that is the case because the Taliban were basically providing a safe haven to global terrorists. New Zealanders have died as a result of that global terrorism. Quite a number, in fact, uh, seven over the last few years. And uh, so it's in our national interests to deal with a, an enemy, effectively, that provides uh, safe haven for terrorists. That's what we're there for. <coughs> and also to go back to that other point, the way that New Zealand, and indeed the whole uh, NATO ISAF nations, leave Afghanistan is to build the capacity of the Afghan government. That's actually the plan. That is what transition actually means. Uh, and and that's why uh, that's why all um, nations that are deployed are partnered with Afghan units. We can't ultimately be responsible for the security of their country. They ultimately have to be responsible for the security of their country. And the intent is to build their capability so they can take over that role. And that's intended to be complete by 2014. Thank you very much. Uh, the family have uh, yet to give their complete guidance as to how they want it to go. Uh, the expectation is that the repatriation uh, of the Smith is probably going to be um, mid, mid next week, so Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday potentially. Uh, that will depend on a lot of their results about availability of flights out of Afghanistan and back to New Zealand and how they uh, have a family issue to go. Who will release the information for the public? And just one more point in closing, I want to say. Um, a lot of our focus has been on the armed conflict. That's only one line of operation for what we're trying to achieve in Afghanistan. Um, and the objective of the security line of operation, that is police and military, is to stop a lot of the conflict so that the governance can be improved, the economics can be improved, the education and the social environment can be improved. Uh, they are not done sequentially. If you don't deal with the security first and then you deal with the others, they've got to be... Um, sorry, uh, they are done together so that we can actually ensure that as we stabilise that those other areas remove the likelihood of further conflict. If we can employ Afghan uh, youth or, or working age men, they are less likely to actually uh, take up uh, money or use Afghan money by taking up insurgent tactics. So just be aware that the military side is only one aspect to it. It is not the military fighting the tactics in the campaign. It's one aspect of how you deal with an insurgency. The long-term effectiveness addresses the cause of the problem, which is economic and social issues and governance issues. And that's the primary approach that uh, the coalition forces are taking in Afghanistan. All our role is to ensure that uh, the various factions don't resort to armed conflict or to minimise that resort to armed conflict so that other aspects can take on. So understand what the role of the military is. It's not there in isolation. Or Albert away, and the others will not be able to do it. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you.